We're going to be looking at three properties of inverse functions. We went ahead and we defined them yesterday, and we looked briefly on how to do some of the very simple computations with them, like how do I, how do I get an inverse? You know, that's the most basic thing. But now we want to understand, in the similar way to how we did it with integration, right? It's like, oh, okay, here's an integral. Get used to doing the thing of integrating, doing the powers in reverse, and not getting confused with differentiation. Then we went ahead and we did things like this. Remember this? Uh, for instance. Um, if f is even, then, sorry, this is a definite integral, right? And because we know something about it, we can take advantage of a property that even functions have. Now just picture in your mind what an even function would look like, and therefore what it would look like if you integrated from negative a to some opposite boundary. What would be able to say? Two, yeah, very good. Two times what? Naught to a, good. So we we slice it right down the middle. Okay, we go from naught to a, and of course, the reason why such a property is useful to know is, <coughs> excuse me, why is the right hand side generally going to be useful to us? All right, why what? Why not just do this? We can, yeah, obviously we're looking at a situation where I can integrate this thing, right? So why do this over this suggestion? Fantastic. When I go ahead and I evaluate, and I go and do this, right? That's going to be nice, generally speaking. Putting zero into things, we're really good at doing that. And that often makes things super, super simple, as opposed to, what would I have on the left-hand side if I just, you know, evaluated that? That's going to be, yeah, for a minus A. And that might just give us more algebraic work and more places for errors to come up, right? So that's what we mean by properties of something. You understand how to integrate it, and then you're like, oh, okay, let's, let's do some fancy stuff. And that's exactly what we're going to do today. Okay, increasing and decreasing functions. Now, we have introduced the language of increasing and decreasing functions before. Let's draw an increasing function over here. Something like, say... That, that's an increasing function. Don't know what it is. I guess it's a cubic from what I've drawn at the moment. And a decreasing function, maybe something like, I'll just do a simple one like that. Okay, so we have an intuition in our minds for an increasing and decreasing function. If you were to explain this to someone who maybe, say, was in year 10, they've met graphs before, what sentence would you give them to say, oh, this is how you recognize what an increasing function is, and here's how you recognize what a decreasing function is. How simple could you boil it down? Like, which direction is it heading on the left-hand side? Which direction right is, it, side. is it heading on the right-hand side? Okay, yeah. so if you track along yeah. from left to right, is it going up or is it going down? That's cool. Can someone give me another one, another way you might articulate it? How, st ooh, how steep it is. Now, that's interesting. Because I, I kind of see where you're going. Do you want to, could you elaborate on that a little bit? Can you, to year 10, can you say, can you describe to me what tangent is? Say, depends on it. Interesting. I'd probably say, like, just practically speaking, probably not. <laughs> I think you'd get a look sort of like a tan what, you know? Um, however, I'll take your point, right? And in fact, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to draw it a little more. That if you were to draw, like, um, imagine a whole series of lines rather than one smooth one, a whole series of straight lines that are nestled up along the curve, that's how I would, that are just touching, rather than saying tangent, because that's what tangent means, after all. Um, they are all doing the same thing that Nikita was describing, right? They're all pointing in that direction, or they're all pointing in this direction, yeah? Okay, now we are at the right point in the course where it's appropriate to actually have a rigorous definition for this kind of thing, okay? So if you have another color there, what I want you to do is pick two points. Any two points, we'll do the increasing one first and then we'll do the decreasing. Pick any two points on your curve. Say here and here. Okay. Now on a circle and on a parabola and on an ellipse and etc. Okay. If you pick any two points and you join those together with an interval. <coughs> right? What do we call such a shape on a circle? Which sort of we use that same word. We call that a chord, right? That's a chord. Uh, it doesn't. It, it's not a line. Line. It goes on forever. It's an interval. It starts and it ends. So I call this guy a chord. Right? 
we looked at chords of the parabola um, under parametrics of Marcus and all that kind of thing. So on any kind of curved shape, we call this a chord. I want you to think about, remember I told you, you can draw your two points, you can plot them anywhere you like, right? So we all have our chords in different spots. However, every single chord we've all drawn shares a property, right? It's the same thing you were kind of describing. But can you explain it in a vigorous, sorry, vigorous, in a rigorous way, not like a, oh, it's going up. How would you articulate it here? What would you say? Yeah. It has a positive gradient. Fantastic. I'm going to go with that, right? I could say the gradient of this chord, right? And I just have two points, so I can just use a regular gradient um, formula if I like, sorry. The gradient of the chord is going to be greater than Zero. Zero. Now, interestingly, I haven't, I deliberately didn't do it on this one. I haven't got any stationary points on this graph. You can picture a graph like saying y equals x cubed. Would you call that an increasing function? y equals x cubed? Y equals Yes. Would you? You would say it was even So the um, the basic answer is, or well, maybe I should say the technical answer is the technical answer is yes. Y equals x cubed is an increasing function. However, so I can say this for increasing. Uh, I'll put it here. But so I'm I'm okay. I'm okay with points where I level off. Okay. However, because you know there is this kind of like, oh yeah, but really, we introduce language to try and distinguish between these two cases. So if the gradient of the chord is positive, which the word positive excludes zero, right? We say actually this is this is more specific, right? So we call this strictly increasing. Now the relationship between these two is kind of a, even though you might not think of it right now, it's kind of a calculus relationship, right? Or a calculus distinction. Because this one is saying, yeah, put your points anywhere. Have a chord, right? But this guy is kind of like imagining a chord and allowing you to have chords of length zero. Right? Does that make sense? Because if I allow myself to have chords of length zero, this is a problem for me, right? Because there will be that one point at the stationary point where it's not, in fact, got a positive gradient. It's got a gradient of zero, right? But if you say, yeah, no, even at a single point, right, you have a positive gradient, your chord then becomes a tangent, right? We call that strictly increasing. It is definitely everywhere always increasing. I guess you could then make a statement about the derivative, the gradient function, and of the gradient function, this would be true. Okay, um, let's draw the corresponding diagram onto our decreasing function, which of course is everything but in reverse. Okay. So, but in the, the chords will never have a gradient here. Because it's Right, so that's the idea that a tangent is the limiting case of a chord, yeah. right? Um, so it's kind of like, this is one of those cases where you, like, can we imagine something with length zero? And the answer is, with calculus we can, but without calculus, these, co these two points have to be distinct, otherwise there's no chord, right? So well, that's why these kinds of are uh, different cases for, are you in calculus mode at the moment? Are you willing to deal with the fact that sometimes you can have things that, that don't exist, that they're there at a point? Um, or are you, no, I'm, I'm really just thinking about two actual points and I want to calculate the gradient. Um, so here, of course, we'll go M of chord here, less than equals zero. And you can, you can complete this here. Okay. Now, increasing decreasing functions, that's nice. You actually already knew this, right? I was just trying to refine your definition. How is this going to relate to inverse functions? Okay. Don't shout anything out yet. Just look at it and think geometrically. Maybe it might help you if you add to your diagrams our uh, y equals x line. In order to find the inverse of a function, <coughs> excuse me. Obviously, we know how to do it algebraically. You have no definition for the expression here, so you can't do that. But you can still find something for the inverse. Because we drew this decreasing function a little simpler, we could go with that. What would this thing look like if I reflected it across y equals x? How would you describe it? Now, the first thing to do is to say, okay, look at this one. Conveniently, it crosses y equals x. Okay? If it's a decreasing function, 
Kind of has to, right? Think about that. Anyway, therefore, the easiest point, you know, when we talk about graphs and like, oh, okay, if you square zero, where's it going to go? Zero, you square one, where's it going to go? There's one point on this graph that is easier to think about than all the rest of the points when you're trying to do this reflection thing. Which point is it? It's the point of intersection, right? This guy right here. Because when you reflect it across y equals x, it stays where it is. It doesn't need to go anywhere, right? So that's kind of nice. What's happening when you're having a look at, say, this side of the graph over here? What will it look like? What you're doing is you're reflecting across, right? It has the same... Same shape. It has a very similar shape, doesn't it, because of the way we've drawn it. What you want to do, and you can literally, unfortunately I cannot look <coughs> off, maybe fortunately, cut my whiteboard off the wall and turn it, but you can turn your page so that your y equals x line is vertical. We are much better at seeing symmetry when it's lined up across our field of vision. Okay? So move it so it's vertical, and then do the reflection. It's not that hard, right? On mine, I'm going to do my best to turn my hair. It's not going to be identical. I think mine's going to come off a little bit like this. And like this, it's slightly flatter on mine anyway. Okay, so yours will be slightly different, but that's okay. So you can see here in blue, if I call the black one f of x, y equals f of x, <clears throat> my blue graph is y equals f inverse of x. Now tell me, what kind of function is our inverse in this case? In terms of increasing, decreasing. Decreasing. It's still decreasing, isn't it? And it kind of has to be, right? If it's decreasing over here, when you reflect it across, because of the line we're reflecting across, it's going to keep on decreasing. And the same thing happens when you do it the other way. Okay? Uh, this one's a little more difficult, but it's not impossible. Uh, the one we've drawn here, I think it's going to look a bit like a vase, right? Again, turn your page. Turn your page so you can see that vertical. And then just think about, okay, I want this on the other side. I want to reflect across, right? On mine, I think it's going to look something like this. What do you think? Does it look okay? Mm -hmm. Drew it in the wrong color, which is not very helpful. I'll redraw it, okay? You've got yours there as well. Again, what kind of statement can you make about what kind of function the universe is? It's still, it's still increasing, right? In exactly the same way, except the argument's just in reverse, okay? So this is just a very brief um, visual argument. You can make a similar one off calculus, which we're not gonna do just yet until I've shown you how to differentiate. Um, the inverse of an increasing function is increasing. The inverse of a decreasing function, decreasing. And that's a really important property to understand. Okay, so let's just state that. sense. It's some simple geometry. I'm going to repeatedly go back to our algebraic and geometric definitions for what inverses are to understand what is going on. And this is a really easy argument to understand. 